All right. So the previous lecture was really packed with a lot of terminology, a lot of facts. This lecture, on the other hand, is going to be almost devoid of any new facts and new terminology. There's going to be a little bit of terminology, but mostly none. Um, but it will require you to think a little bit uh, in order to understand some of the concepts. Okay, so basically you can sit back, you're not going to be probably writing a lot of stuff, okay, but it's more about understanding what is going on, okay. For some this is going to be a lot easier than the previous one, for others it may not, we'll see. So this lecture is about how we analyze, how we measure the properties, the parameters of binding of a specific ligand to a receptor. Now, why do we need that? Well, first of all, it can, for example, tell us, as I said before, that uh, alpha receptors have a higher affinity for noradrenaline and beta receptors have a higher affinity for adrenaline. Okay? This is something we need to have a way to measure, to quantify, in order to be able to compare these things, because then we can say, okay, if this mixture of noradrenaline and adrenaline is released into the, to the cells, this is what will happen. Okay, uh, it's even more important when we start designing new ligands for receptors, so medications, because then we need to find out, okay, is this new ligand, does it have a higher affinity for the receptor? Does it have a lower affinity for the receptor? Is it specific for this receptor? Is it, you know, general, will it bind to all receptors? So we have to have a way to describe this <clears throat> and to compare different ligands and different receptors between them, okay? If you make a drug, which binds to a receptor, but the affinity is a million times lower than your natural ligand, than your neurotransmitter or hormone, then it's probably not going to be very useful because the natural ligand is going to be so strong that it will overpower the effect of this new ligand. Okay? So is, is it clear why we're doing this, how, why it's useful? Hopefully it is. So let's see how we can conceptualize it this binding and how we can measure it in experiment. So let us assume that one molecule of ligand always binds to one molecule of receptor. Okay? This is not always true. We do have receptors where more than one, actually many receptors bind more than one molecule of ligand. But just to make it simple, let's assume that this is the case. So we can basically write a chemical reaction between a receptor plus a ligand giving us reversibly a complex of receptor ligand, right? Nothing mysterious there, okay? And if we mix certain amount or certain number of receptor molecules with a certain amount of ligand molecules, we will get an equilibrium. And at this equilibrium, so there will be some ratio of the free molecules and the bound molecules, so in this equilibrium, we can define an equilibrium constant, right? So we can find, we can have an equilibrium constant, and this will be equal to, for this reaction, okay, lots of people are saying very small words, so maybe tell me a little bit more, yeah? All right, so it's going to be the concentration of the product, okay, at equilibrium, divided by the concentration of the reactants, like so, right? That's going to be the equilibrium constant. Good. Now, this equilibrium constant is what we call association constant because it tell us, tells us the equilibrium constant in this direction where things associate, okay? For whatever reason, the equilibrium constant that we use to derive the formulas that I will talk about is the opposite equilibrium constant, which is called the dissociation constant. It's the same thing. The dissociation constant is equal to one over, I mean, it's not the same thing, but they are easily related. It's just flipping this around. Okay, so KD is equal to 1 over KA, otherwise it's the same thing. We just flip this around because we're looking at it from the opposite direction. 
Is it clear? Yeah, those two things are very closely related. But we use the dissociation constant. And the dissociation constant then is equal to the concentration of a free receptor of a free ligand divided by the concentration of the combined complex. Right, so that's the dissociation constant. We could just, e just as easily, we could do the derivation using the association constant. It's just not done, so we can use this one. All right, so we have the expression that relates the KD, which is the parameter that tells us about the affinity of the receptor to the ligand, right? So that's usually the thing that we are interested in, that we're looking for, how it relates to all these concentrations. So let's now imagine that we want to measure this KD, we want to find out for our specific ligand to, and our specific receptor, we want to find out the KD, okay? What is the affinity? So the traditional experiment that used to be done and still is in some places, okay, there are some other methods, but this is the classical method. You take your tissue where you know the receptor is. Typically it was done with brain tissue, so you would take from a, from a mouse or a rat, you would take the brain, you would homogenize it, you would, you know, uh, would make a homogenate out of it, um, which breaks down all the cells, and you are basically left with just the membranes just the membranes of the neurons. And the membranes carry those receptors. So we have a preparation, you clean everything else out, and you have a clean preparation of just the membranes with the receptors, basically, in your test tube, okay? Then you add varying amounts of your ligand, but of course, since you want to measure how much binds, you have to label it. And traditionally, this was labeled with radioactive elements. So you would make a radioactive version of the ligand, okay, radioactive. You would add to it, and then you would filter out the membranes by centrifugation or filtration or something like that. You would filter them out, and you would measure how much of the radioactivity is stuck to the membranes. And that will tell you how much of the ligand was bound to your membranes, to your receptors. Okay? So that's the experiment, right? But then, or now, the question is, okay, how can we use this formula to then take the results of the experiment and figure out what our KD is, okay? I will show you, okay? You don't have to figure it out. It's enough if you just understand it. The biggest problem here is that we can't really measure the amount of receptors. Okay? There's no easy way to measure it. Okay? There are probably some methods. We could use a Western blot or something, but historically, this wasn't really available. Okay? We couldn't quite measure how much of these receptors are there because oftentimes, we didn't know what these receptors were. Okay? Nobody knew about the identity. Now we know everything about the human genome, but you know, 20 or 30 years ago, people didn't know, so they couldn't know what the receptor actually looks like, so they couldn't measure this. So the whole thing that I'm now going to be doing is basically how to get the data or how to use this formula on the data without really figuring out what R is, okay? And in order to do that, we're going to use a few tricks. So the first trick is that we defined a quantity called binding, which basically just is what I just described in the experiment. So we're adding this radioactively labeled ligand, and we're measuring how much of the radioactivity sticks to our membranes, okay? So the amount of binding will be called binding, okay? It will become clear why, why I'm doing that, okay? So binding is really, in this equation, is equal to what? To the concentration of the complex, right? Because it's the complex that we see as this radioactivity because we filter out the receptors, the membranes, and, and we see the radio radioactivity, so it has to be the concentration of the, of the complex. So B is equal to R L. So far, it should hopefully be easy. Now comes the trick. So imagine that you're doing this experiment again and again with higher and higher concentrations, and at some point, you're going to saturate all your receptors with your radioactive ligand, okay? 
in theory at infinity, but in reality, you will get to some maximum binding and it's not gonna go over that, okay? You have saturated all your receptors. So here we have B max, the maximum binding, okay? Which we can experimentally find out by just adding a lot of the ligand. Now the question is, what is B max equal to? So you say that it's equal to receptors. I will say you're correct, but what is receptors in this equation? Say again. Correct. So B max, I'll, I'll repeat it, don't worry, and explain it. B max is equal to R, plus RL. Why? Do you want to explain why that is so? No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me do then. Uh, <laughs> in the maximum binding, I said that we have occupied all the receptors that are available. Yeah, so B max is equal to the total number of receptors that we have. Okay, because all of them are occupied in B max. Okay, so that's our maximum. All the receptors have been occupied by this ligand. And the total number of receptors at any point has to be equal to the sum of the free receptors plus the occupied receptors. At any point, the receptors are either occupied or, or empty or free. There is, there is no other possibility. So if you sum those two together, this should always give you the total number. No matter how many are in the specific situation, no matter how many are free and are occupied, if you sum those two together, it always has to give you the total number of receptors. This, th this is the most difficult bit, okay? Once you get this, it's easy. Correct. In this point, the concentration of R is zero. But in this point, it's going to be different ratio of the two. But every time, if you sum those two together, it has to give you the B max. Okay? No matter where you are. In the beginning here, it's going to be all R and no RL, but still it's going to have to equal to B max. Correct, correct. That is true. But that's only in this specific point, okay? But at any point, this has to be equal, okay? If you are unsure, raise your hand and ask, because after that, it's easy. There's gonna be a little bit of algebra and, and that's it. It's, it's easy. But this is the most difficult step. I think a lot of people have trouble seeing this because as you say correctly at this point it's there's not going to be any free r it's all going to be in rl that's true but in all the other points there's going to be a different number of either of them but if you sum them together it always at any point has to be equal to b max because it's the total number of receptors yeah good so and that's it now we just rearrange the formula we plug in those B and B maxes, and that's it. So we said that it's very difficult to get this R. We don't know it. So we can express this R by using this formula. So R is going to be equal to B max minus RL. We put it into the formula. So KD is equal to B max minus RL, uh, sorry, B max minus B, because we defined RL to be B, right? Just to make it a little bit easier. Uh, where are we? Times L divided by B. Just take your time, have a look at it, if it makes sense, okay? And then we just re 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 rearrange it. <coughs> R is free receptors. At any point, 
the concentration of R, which must be equal to the total number of receptors minus the occupied. Yeah? No? Okay. There will be recordings so you can have a look at it in slower uh, pace if, if you need to. All right. Now we just rearrange it. Okay? So we multiply by B. B times KB is equal to B max times L minus B times L. Okay, so I've just multiplied this out and then multiplied by B. That's all I've done. Okay, now let's move this with B. Let's move it together with this term with B. So we're going to have B times KD plus B times L is equal to B max times L. I understand everything you've done. I'm just missing the point of it. Like, what are, what's, what's our target? What are you trying to do? Our target is, because this is our experiment, this is our experimental data, mm -hmm. okay? And what we need out of this, so this is what we measure, okay? We can, we can see these things. And our goal, really, is to find out KD. So what we're now rearranging is to get an expression for KD, which only has these things. I mean, it, we sort of have it here, but there is another reason for rearranging it, because you'll see in a second that the resulting equation is something that you've seen before, okay? So it's truly, we already have it here, okay? But let's just rearrange it, because it will give you a better, hopefully a better perspective on it, okay? So this is this, we multiply out B and divided by, uh, yeah, we multiplied, uh, we, yes. What, are, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> KD plus L. So we take this out. It's equal to B max times L. Okay. And then we take this whole thing and divide it. So we're going to have B is equal to B max times L divided by KD plus L. And this is the final equation that puts, that gives us the relationship between the concentration of ligand and the binding using two parameters, which is B max and KD. Now, you've seen this before with slightly different letters in it, yeah. but yeah, so what is the, what is the formula? Uh, uh, no, what, what, is it, what is the name of the formula? Uh, well, that's just the constant, but the whole thing is called Michaelis and Menten kinetics, and it's used to describe enzyme kinetics. Okay, it looks almost the same, only we're going to have V is equal to V max times substrate divided by Km plus substrate, right? So the, the form of the equation is the same. And this is no accident. The derivation, the, the, the how the Michaelis Menten kinetics is derived, is basically this derivation. Because in the, in the Michaelis and Menten model of enzyme kinetics, what we, what we assume is that we have free enzyme molecules and free substrate molecules, which form a complex. And once the complex is formed, the product is formed. So basically, what michaelis menten kinetics is really describing is the association between the substrate and the enzyme the same way as we have here between ligand and receptor. The mathematics is the same, or very similar, okay? There is no rate, etc. cetera, but, but basically the derivation is the same, okay? So if you wanted to derive michaelis menten kinetics, you're going to use a very similar um, approach. Okay, so now we have a way how to use this data to calculate KD or how to relate binding to, um, to the ligand. Okay, yes, we could use this formula as well, but then we wouldn't see this beautiful uh, relationship.
any questions about the derivation? Because now we're going to start looking at uh, some graphical descriptions of that. If you are baffled, uh, you're not quite sure about what's going on, it might be a good idea to ask now. We do have a little bit of time, and maybe I can explain it better than someone else. Maybe not, but if you aren't sure, maybe you could ask. It's fine. Good. So let's have a look at some graphs. So the uh, show it here. So the graph of binding as a function of the ligand concentration is going to have this familiar shape that we've seen from enzyme kinetics, where we can define as it's it's coming closer asymptotically closer and closer to B max. So this is going to be our B max. And then, again, it's mathematically equivalent. So if we take Bmax over 2, we are going to get the parameter, which is KD, okay? which is the dissociation constant. In other words, the dissociation, so can anyone recall the definition of KM, of Michaelis constant? What is it? Correct. So Michaelis, Michaelis constant is defined as the concentration of substrate at which the rate of the reaction is half of Vmax. So analogically, we can just say KD is the concentration of ligand at which the binding is equal to Vmax over 2, half Vmax. Okay? Same thing. The, the maths is the same. Right? So this is going to be our binding curve according to this formula. Now, this was our one ligand. Let's assume that it's the neurotransmitter. Let's say it's dopamine, OK? So this is the binding of dopamine to a dopamine receptor, OK, with some KD. Now, let's complicate it a little bit. And let's assume that we've added some medication, some drug, which also binds, or we think it binds, to a dopamine receptor. And we want to see how it affects the binding of dopamine to the receptor. I will say it again. So in the beginning of the experiment, we add some amount of some drug, which also binds to, um, uh, to dopamine receptor in this case. And we want to see how this addition of something else will affect the binding of dopamine. OK? So what are the possibilities? One possibility is that the two molecules, so dopamine and our drug, will be competing for the same site. Okay, So they will be competing for the binding. So if we look at the binding of dopamine, what we will see is a similar picture to competitive inhibition of enzymes. So we will see that in the end, at very high concentration of dopamine, of dopamine the dopamine will push the, the drug out of the binding site on the receptor because there's just the concentration is so much higher than what we had for the um, uh, for the medication right so we will observe as if as if the affinity of the receptor decreased for dopamine this is what the drug will be doing it will be decreasing the apparent affinity yeah dopamine will have harder time binding so you can see that the binding is lower all the time but in the in the end we will push it out because there's going to be a lot of dopamine present. OK? Now, the other possibility is that this drug binds to a completely different site, which is completely unrelated to the site where dopamine binds. What will the binding of dopamine look in this case like? It will be exactly the same. Right? Yes, supposed to be. Yeah, because it's not influencing the binding of dopamine. It's going to be exactly the same. Okay, so we will see exactly the same 
thing. Okay. Now these are for reversible, for reversible ligands. These are basically the two possibilities. Either they are influencing each other. In that case, they're probably going to be competing with each other. Okay. Or they're not influencing each other, and therefore it will not affect the binding at all. There are other possibilities. So the ligand or the drug could be an irreversible ligand. It could bind to the active site and just stay there. Okay. In this case, we will find that the binding, well, let's use a different color, that the binding will look something like this. We will never get to Bmax because some of the binding sites will be forever blocked by this irreversible ligand. Okay, so that's another possibility. Okay, but for reversible ligands, either they are influencing each other or they're not. They're competing or they're not competing. Okay, and in that in that case, the binding is going to be the same. Yep. Good. Now let's have a look at effect. So this was binding. This was just purely binding to the receptor. Now let's have a look at effect of what is going to happen when the ligand binds to the receptor. We can use a very similar description, mathematical description and, and everything, to relate the concentration of ligand to the effect. Now, what is an effect? So, for example, a traditional experiment, okay, you take a little bit of the gut of a mouse or something, you put it on a spring and you start adding some stuff which causes contraction of the muscles and obviously the gut will contract and you can measure the length of it, for example, or the shortening of it. Or you can have a mouse heart and you can add some hormones and you can measure the, the frequency of the beating or whatever. Okay? Or you can take some cell and measure the secretion of something that the cell is secreting. Okay? Any kind of effect that you can think of could be mathematically related to the amount of the ligand. All right? Now, here we come to the com complication. For binding, either something binds or it do doesn't bind. That's it, okay? You can't have any gradation of that. I mean, you can have gradation, so we can have different affinity, but that's it. But for effect, here we can divide ligands into several different types. We can have agonists, And agonists are ligands that activate the receptor. They act on the receptor, they will activate. We have antagonists. Which bind to the receptor, but don't do anything. They basically do not activate the, um, uh, the receptor. Okay? They don't activate it. Those are called antagonists. Usually what they do is, they sit into the same binding site as the ligand. They don't activate the receptor, but obviously, since they are there, they are blocking access to the, neuro to the neurotransmitter or to, to the natural ligand. So they will, they will block the effect of ligand, even though themselves they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. So those would be called antagonists. Then we have partial agonists. Partial agonists sit somewhere between antagonists and agonists. So they will not cause a full activation of the receptor, but they will activate it. So they will activate it a little bit, okay? 30%, 20%, 90%, somewhere between the full agonist and the antagonist. Now, a lot of the time students ask me, well, how is it possible that you can activate a receptor just like halfway? H how does it work, okay? Huh? It's no, it has nothing to do with affinity. These things have nothing to do with affinity. These, catag these categories describe what is called a potency. So this is a term called potency. And it's basically what happens once the ligand is bound, what happens to the receptor. This is called potency. Affinity tells you how easy it is for the ligand to bind. Potency says, once it's bound, what will it do on the, on the receptor? Okay? 
So this is a different thing than, than affinity. Affinity describes the binding. Potency describes effect. Now, so how is it possible that a receptor can be half activated? Well, for example, it's, it's quite easy to see with an ion channel. Okay, so we have an ion channel, and even without a ligand, so a ligand-gated ion channel, even without a ligand, usually the channel opens and closes, but it spends most of the time in the closed conformation. So we will not allow ions to go through because most of the time it's closed. What the agonist and partial agonist ligands do is they increase the proportion of time that the iron channel spends in the open conformation. And you can see that it, that it can be a gradual, okay, so it can be from 3% activation to 10% activation to 30% to 90% to 100% or whatever, okay? So you can have all those different gradations of potency for different ligands because they will just change the probability of opening. It's similar for metabotropic receptors. It, it works the same way. It's all about probabilities, okay? But it's easier to see with the, um, uh, with the iron channel. The last possible uh, type of effector or whatever of ligand, they're called inverse agonists. And an inverse agonist will bind to the receptor and will cause the opposite effect. Now this is strange, okay? Because for antagonists, we just said, well, it sits there, it does nothing, okay? An inverse agonist will cause an opposite effect. With the example of an ion channel, which spends some time open, basically, even without a ligand, you can imagine that the inverse agonist comes in and decreases the probability even more than it is without an ligand. So I'll say that again. We have an ion channel that spends, let's say, 10% of the time open without an ligand. If we add a full agonist, it will spend 100% time open. Okay? If we add a partial agonist, it will spend 50% or whatever, 75%, whatever, yeah? in the open uh, formation. If we add an antagonist, it's going to stay at 10%. If we add an inverse agonist, it's going to go down to 1%, for example. Okay? So it causes the opposite effect. Those are quite unusual, but they do exist. There is at least one medication which is an inverse agonist. Um, we may talk about it tomorrow. We'll see how, how it goes. Uh, but So it's not a theoretical thing. that do exist medications like this, but just so you know the difference. All right. Let's think about effects. So the effect curve of a full agonist is going to look like this. We're going to get an Emax maximum effect, right? It's going to come closer and closer with increasing concentration. And we're going to have another parameter, which is called EC50, or half maximal effective concentration which is going to be the equivalent of KD, but for effect, okay? Not for binding. Yeah? Good. If we take the effect of an antagonist, let's say, what, what is it going to look like if we just keep adding antagonists at higher, higher, higher concentrations? Linear. Linear? It is going to be linear, but in what way is it going to be linear? It's just, ju just, we're not mixing things. We're just adding antagonist. Exactly. I'll say that again, okay? So the experiment is, we have our piece of gut or whatever, okay? And the thing that we're adding in increasing concentrations is gonna be an antagonist of the receptor. So the same as the no, this is gonna be the no effect. It's an antagonist. It's not gonna do anything. It will bind, okay, so the binding will be, will be like this, but it will cause no effect because it is an antagonist. But here we're not mixing anything together. What I'm saying now is we're not adding something and then, then adding the neurotransmitter. Here we're just adding an antagonist, okay. no effect, okay? What about partial agonist? 
Yeah, it's going to be something like this, okay? Maybe it will reach Emacs, maybe not. I will get to that, okay? Probably not, okay? Because it's never going to able it's it's never going to be able to get 100% out of it. So probably never going to reach Emacs, okay? But it's going to be lower, obviously. What about inverse agonist? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's going to do something like this, okay? An inverse agonist. So So for example, when you have the gut, you have a certain measure. The agonists will be shortening the gut. The inverse agonists will be prolonging the gut. Yeah. All right. Now let's start mixing things together a little bit. OK. So let's assume, and th this is just kind of a showing you the possibilities, OK? Because then you can think about them at home, about, because there are so many different combinations of what can happen, OK? So imagine that we add a little bit of antagonist in the beginning, and then we start adding the agonist. So it's very We start with antagonist in the beginning, so we add a little bit of antagonist. So it's not changing. And then we start adding like this, we're going to start adding the agonist, the ligand, the natural ligand. <laughs> Think about it. Huh? Yeah, so there's going to be a lower effect because there's always this little bit of antagonist which is blocking some of the binding sites. But of course, the exact shape of the curve will depend on whether they are competing or whether they are not competing. Okay, so if they are competing, then we will, in the end, get to Emacs because the natural ligand will just push it out. But if they are not competing between, between each other, then it's never going to reach Emacs because there is always the recept some of the receptors will always be occupied with the non-competitive antagonist. Okay, so this. The difference between these two curves, this is competitive antagonist and this is non-competitive antagonist. Competitive because it's always the antagonist that wins? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. In a competitive, yes. You could say that the, the agonist will always win, okay? The, the natural ligand. Because you keep adding more and more. With the antagonist, you just added some amount, okay? Here you are increasing, you're going to infinities. Of course, in the end, it will win, okay? Well, it binds to a different place than the natural ligand, um. okay? So you can't push it out of the binding site by increasing the amount of ligand because they are binding to different places. They're not influencing their binding in any way. So why is it slower? Well, because it blocks the effect. If the antagonist is there, it's, it's not allowing the receptor to be activated. So it's blocking the effect. Yeah, it is basically an allosteric ligand. It's binding to a different site, but it's stopping the, the receptor from activating. Okay, so we'll never reach, in the non competitive case, we'll never reach the original uh, thing. Let's have a look at this same experiment. So we've added a little bit of the drug, and then we are starting to add the, the natural ligand. But let's have a look at the case of a partial agonist. It's a partial agonist. So we added a little bit of partial agonist, and then we start adding the natural ligand, and we're looking at effect. What is it going to look like? Hmm? Well, think about it. There's going to be something very importantly different if we, use, if we start with the partial agonist. It's not going to be linear. But it would be like different uh, slope. slope? Yeah. yeah slope. The interesting thing about starting with a partial agonist is that the partial agonist itself is already an agonist. So you're not going to start at zero because the partial agonist has some effect already before we start adding our ligand. So we will start at some effect, but then it's going to go up, but it's going to be probably lower than the pure agonist because it's a partial agonist. Mm 
So we're going to start above zero. It's going to be higher than in the case of the pure agonist because the concentration was lower here. But then it's going to be lower in the end. And if they are competitive, in the end, we're going to reach Emax. That's fine. Why am I showing you this? Partial agonists are often used in pharmacology to kind of balance out the effects or balance out the extremes. With a partial agonist, if there is too little of the natural ligand, there's going to be some effect because the partial agonist is going to do what the, what the lack of the, agonist, or the lack of the ligand would otherwise not do. So the partial agonist at low concentrations of the natural ligand will look like an agonist. It will increase the function. But as the concentration of the natural ligand increases, it will start acting as an antagonist because it's less effective than the full ligand, okay, the full agonist. So partial agonists have this balancing capability where if there's too little, they will push it up. If there's too much, they will push it down. Okay, and this, this in some instances is a very useful property. Okay, so this is what partial agonists can do. Now with inverse agonists, I'll leave that, I'll leave that to you to, to think about uh, how, how this could work. Last, last thing I'll say, and then I'll end there, uh, is the concept of spare receptors. Spare receptors. This is a concept, a phenomenon, that is actually, that is actually observed in experiment, and that's the fact that in most cells, tissues, organs, what have you, you don't need to activate 100% of receptors in order to get 100% effect. I'll say it again, okay? Spare receptors means that in most situations you don't need to activate 100% of receptors in order to get 100% effect. So basically, in many situations, there are so many unused spare receptors that you don't even need to activate. Um, they are just sitting around in case, just in case. So often it's enough just to activate 10% of receptors, for example, in order to get 100% of effect. And if you keep adding more and more, there's not going to be an increase in effect because you already got to 100% effect. Okay? So this is caused, first of all, the, by the fact that there are more receptors that are needed. But also, the signal in most signaling cascades, as you will recall, is quite heavily amplified. Okay? One G-protein-coupled receptor can activate several G-proteins. Each G-alpha-S, or G-alpha subunit, can activate many different effector proteins, many different molecules of adenylate cyclase. Each molecule of adenylate cyclase can produce a lot of molecules of CAMP. Okay, so you get a massive amplification of the signal going even from one receptor. So this is how we can get 100% effect without actually activating 100% of receptors. This complicates these pictures quite a bit. Because, for example, for non-competitive antagonists, I said, well, we can never reach Emax, right? because some of, the, some of the receptors will be occupied by this non-competitive antagonist and we can't push them out. If there are spare receptors, maybe it's possible to actually get to Emax because even if 50% of all receptors are occupied by this antagonist, these 50% that are not are enough to get you to 100% effect. Okay? So in this case, if there are spare receptors, things look very differently and you can get very easily to 100% effect without activating 100% of receptors. Right, questions? That's it, That's it. questions. Let me, let me just, before we, uh, yeah, before we leave, let me just give you a different version of this for the effect. So we, we can have the same mathematical description for the effect, which looks like this. and it describes the effect, okay? It's, it's basically the same formula, but here you have Emax and EC50. Just beware, and that should be one of the biggest takeaways from this lecture, binding and effect are not the same thing, okay? We can have binding, 
but in case of an antagonist, there's not going to be any effect. Okay? Now, of course, in order to have effect, we need binding. So binding is a necessary condition, but it's not enough. We need to know whether the, the ligand is an agonist, antagonist, partial agonist, inverse agonist, because that tells us what it's actually going to do. It tells us its potency on the receptor. All right? Okay. All right. <laughs>